Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, to what you have said. And the angel departed from her. God bless the reading of his word. So I'm going to throw up right here. This is a picture taken from our trip to Israel in past March. This is in a building called the Church of the Annunciation, which is the fancy tactical name for what happened here. Um, and the, the gal in the pink shirt, that's Tammy taking a picture of the ceiling. Um, the building... The, the old stone building kind of in the center of this massive, enormous church is a building from the time period. Um, they say it's the exact house where Mary was visited by Gabriel. I don't think it was. But what it is, is a house of the exact style from the exact time period, from the exact place where Mary was visited from an angel. And as you can see, and this is true even of abodes of that time period, this is a very humble dwelling. We enter the text today six months after another miraculous conception, which we will talk about later, and we find ourselves in a small town of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, Galilee was at this time a pastoral region to the south of Jerusalem, and Nazareth was a town that at this time existed primarily to provide work to the local Roman settlements and to work in the local white stone quarry. Um, so it was, therefore, a blue-collar, working-class village, about as blue-collar and working-class as you can get in all of human history. Um, so it makes sense, then, that we read that Jesus' father was a skilled laborer, a skilled carpenter, and Jesus himself grew up practicing that trade. Now, we actually only have a single verse in the entire Bible where we get someone's perspective on Nazareth. Um, when Jesus was gathering up his disciples, uh, one of them, called Philip, goes off to find his friend Nathaniel, uh, a, well, a very well-learned, very hoity-toity, very smart man who Scripture usually calls by his surname Bartholomew. And uh, he says, uh, uh, Philip says in John 1, 45, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about who the prophet spoke. We found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, and Bartholomew's response. Now, Bartholomew, he is one of the 12. He received the Holy Spirit at Antioch. He brought the gospel to India and founded the Armenian church and was eventually um, martyred in a brutal faction. His response was, Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Um, so it seems that the working class has always been the butt of jokes, right? So this town, it's unimportant to outsiders and it's unremarkable to its inhabitants. It was to be the site of a prophesied conversation that would change literally everything. And it all centered around a young woman unimportant to outsiders and unremarkable to her neighbors of only about 16 to 18 years old. Her name was Mary, and God chose her to carry his son. 
So let's get in the text and find out more about this. So in verse 26, we read that this passage opens up with an angel named Gabriel who's speeding away from God's very throne where he'd been given an extremely important assignment by God to visit this unremarkable, unimportant young woman in this unrem unremarkable, unimportant town. And who is this woman? A virgin named Mary who is bound by mutual covenant betrothed to a man named Joseph who is a very distant descendant of King David. Now, the fact that this text identifies Mary as a virgin twice is important for two reasons. Firstly, it is important because it confirms what uh, theologians call the immaculate conception, which is simply put, Mary, when she, was, when she became married to Joseph, though she was already pregnant with child, and she had that child, she was a virgin. All right? So that's, that's the first factor, is that she was a virgin when the, the angel married her. She was a virgin when she married Joseph, but she had a baby, two and two together, immaculate conception. This child is not of man and woman, but of God's will. But secondly, it's important for another reason. It's important because it establishes the kind of woman Mary was. Mary kept herself for her husband. So despite all of our, I, I love hearing people saying, oh man, people were so much morally better back in the day. No, they weren't, all right? Despite all of our rose-tinted glasses and assumptions about the past, there, is, there was just as much pressure on Mary for her to uh, slip the bounds of the outdated moral code of the day, to, to live it up, to enjoy life. Just as much pressure on her as there is on the young folks of today. Now, she didn't have an iPhone, that's a key difference, but she absolutely experienced that pressure. And I would go so far as to say, um, the, provide, the pervading culture of the day was the Roman culture. And if you've learned anything about Rome ever, you know that Rome makes America look like a quaint, old-timey, moral place. Rome was terrible, and she lived in close vicinity to high-cultured, and we all know what that means, areas of Roman influence. So absolutely, she practiced what she believed, and subsequent verses highlight the fact that she was righteous. And when I say righteous here, I just mean that she strove to do what God's word had taught her to do. However, verse 28 reads, and he came to her and saying, greetings, O favorite one, the Lord is with you. No righteousness, no good deed could absolutely ever earn her the favor that God gives her through Gabriel's greetings. Now, this singular statement should ground our conversation about Mary for the, for the, for the rest of the sermon, all right? I have no doubt Mary is a remarkable young woman, Maybe the most remarkable woman to ever live, full stop. No other woman in scripture did God choose to bear his son. And unlike many Bible characters who we find God coming to in a place of their destitution or their sin or their brokenness, Mary was doing fine. She was doing really good. Um, so I, you know, I, 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 I want to highlight that. I think Mary was doing, doing great. Mary is a completely remarkable person. However, Mary is ultimately defined by God's relation to her, not by her goodness before God. God has chosen to favor her, listen, over and above what her deeds have merited, as God does with you and with me. No amount, and I cannot stress this enough, no amount of good choices, righteous behavior, or clean living could ever earn any of us the favor of being Christ's parents, right? <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing. And if we are ever left in doubt, we should turn back here to hear how Gabriel addresses her, favored and, with, and to whom the Lord is with. However, looking forward to verse 29, what the favor meant was not immediately clear. The scripture states that she was greatly troubled at what Gabriel had told her. And I, I don't think we can blame her. Every time an angel appears to anyone in the Bible, the angel has to immediately say, like, don't be afraid. Everything's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, and uh, so it, it sounds, in retrospect, pretty nice. Like, oh, an angel appeared and says, you're favored. And we think, like, oh, wow, we'd love to hear that. But clearly, she was freaking out in this time period. Um, so sensing her fear, verse 30, the angel rushes to her and reassures her and reiterates that she has found favor with 
God. Now, I want to talk about this. This serves several purposes. Firstly, as with the word virgin, anytime something is repeated in Scripture, it has special weight. Now, when God says something once, does he have to say it again? No. No. When God speaks, that's his will. He only has to speak once. In fact, many times, God only speaks once because that's how the power of his word. However, for our sake, for our benefit, for our weak minds, for our woozy hearts, sometimes we need things repeated to us, right? That we might be strengthened and our unbelief turned to belief. So overwhelmed, Mary must have been, that perhaps that she missed that not only was God with her, but she was favored. So I think there was that repetition for her benefit as well. But secondly, uh, it, it, it connects to the upcoming statement. So the real reason Gabriel came to her, uh, it, it connects that she was favored. Now, now, what I mean by this is that what she was about to receive, okay, her being the mother of Jesus, it wasn't a test, it wasn't a trial, it wasn't a chore, it wasn't a temptation, it wasn't a punishment, it wasn't any of these things. It was a very real blessing she was receiving due to her status as favored. Can we all agree that it's a blessing to be mother, Christ's mother? <laughs> I think it's a blessing. And so that was something reinforced to her. This is not, I'm not about to put you through a trial. This is a blessing I'm giving you. But thirdly, we got to take note here of how Gabriel phrases this. He phrases this differently than he did at the beginning. So in his first statement in verse 28, Gabriel makes it clear unequivocally that she is favored by God, right? God is doing the action here. God is favoring Mary. Now, Romans 9, 18 reads, so then God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardened whomever he wills. And I think that, as, along as many other verses, makes it absolutely clear that God's arm is not twisted, God's mind is not manipulated, um, and he gives and withholds his blessings as he understands it, not as we understand it. This is a work of God's power for God's purpose according to God's plan. Amen? Amen. And yet, we find Gabriel offering her the assurance that what? That her righteousness was not in vain. For, what is this? You have found favor with God. Acts 7 46 reads how David and his deeds also found favor with God. And many, many men and women throughout Scripture and throughout time have also chosen to do what is right over wrong, trusting the promises of God over the temptations of the world. And isn't this what God's Word itself teaches? Proverbs 1, 32-33 reads, I love this, For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread or disaster. When we are in a covenantal relationship with Christ, doing right, following God, does not make God love us better, love us more, more passionate for us. Nor does doing sin cause God to hate us or despise us or, from his perspective, grow far away from us or ignore us or even let us go. Okay, that doesn't happen. Yet, let me ask you, church, isn't it better to taste and see that the Lord is good as opposed to suffering God's discipline? I think so. I, I would much rather taste and see that the Lord is good than being reminded of his goodness through his discipline. So, Gary, so let's, let's return to this passage. Gabriel is not trying to give marry her power back, right? This is happening because you willed it, because you're, you're so good. He's not trying to boost her ego. She's not trying to compliment her good works. Rather, listen to this, he is connecting her worship to the God of the universe. This is not a random, uninterested, cosmic force that has just now taken attention of her. This is the God whom she grew up and followed all the days of her lives. Mary, God listened to your prayers. Mary, God saw you turn from evil and pursue good. This is crazy to me. Mary, it mattered to the God of the universe what you did with your body. 
That's wild. That's crazy. We do not earn God's love. When was it given to us? When Christ was on the cross. We didn't earn that. That's given to us. That is given to all people. But our lives, beyond a shadow of a doubt, matter to the highest of high, the king of all kings, the creator of the universe. Your decision, my decision to do right over wrong, choose wisdom over foolishness, choose trust in God's word over listening to the propaganda of the world, it's deeply impactful and meaningful on a cosmic scale. (laughs) Aren't we promised that at the end of all things, we will hear our Savior say to us, well done, my good and faithful servants. What, What Mary did matters, and she found favor with God for that. What you do matters, and you too shall find favor with God for it. It might not be the favor of man. It might not be the favor that you or I would choose. Because this, I think that this put a pretty big wrecking ball in Mary's plans for her life, right? But nevertheless, what Mary did, what you do, what I do, matters. And what was this God, the God who knew and loved Mary deeply, going to do? Gabriel tells her three promises. Number one, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will sh- shall call his name Jesus, which means the salvation of God. Two, God will give to him the throne of his father David, and three, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That is exact quotes from the passage. Those are the three promises God gives them. And with this grand statement, Gabriel lays out exactly, exactly what the blessing will be for Mary. She will be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah. Now, there's a lot of prophetic prophecies, messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that we know and understand because of the Holy Spirit and because Jesus explained them to us. In retrospect, we'll say like, oh, of course, of course that was about Jesus, of course. So many of those prophecies were not recognized as messianic prophecies at the time period. However, there were some that were absolutely recognized, that even non-faithful Jews, worn down by years of Roman occupation and political insignificance, would, they would know this by heart. What does everyone know? Everyone knows John 3, what? John 3, 16. These passages about the Messiah were kind of their John 3, 16. They didn't have a knowledge that God loved the world and he sent his son. They were hoping that he would soon do something. And so they clung to these things. So I have little doubt that Mary, having already shown herself to be a person of faith, uh, who faithfully followed God's word, would be more familiar with these passages. At least as familiar, but maybe even more familiar. And these passages are as follows. Oop, wrong way. Here we go. Three prophecies. Prophecy number one, Isaiah 7, 14. You shall conceive in your womb. Oh, nope. Here we go. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel, which means God who is with us. It's the exact same wording. Conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be. Number two, Isaiah 9, 7b. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Very similar identical wording in some portions. And finally, Isaiah 9, 7 a, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. All right, there will be no end. Again, exact same wording here. God's promise to Mary, whom he knew and loved deeply, and the fu- are the fulfillment of the promises he made to his people and he made to us, whom he knows and he loves dearly. Okay, so When Mary was given these prophecies, she was very clearly being communicated in the prophetic words of the day, in the languages of the day, that she will be giving birth to the Messiah. Imagine if a Gabriel, I mean, if if, an angel or Gabriel came to you today and said, woman, you shall have a son and he will be born in a manger and there will be three wise men who who come to him and he will be called Jesus. We know what they're talking about. Right? Even people who aren't super strong Christians would understand what is being said. 
very similarly here in this section. So then Mary asks, she, well, she says to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Okay. This is, I always love walking through very familiar passages because I always end up discovering something that just blows my mind. And that's where I'm here today. Okay, so when we usually take this verse, we usually take this passage to be Mary asking how what was promised to her physically possible because she's a virgin. However, um, they, I know this is going to be crazy, they knew how to make babies, all right? They've been doing it for like 4,000 years. They worked out the process some time ago, and they weren't like, well, how is this, what on earth? This is crazy. I don't know how this is possible. So I, I, I think that makes sense that we take this passage to mean this, her just asking, a teenage girl asking like, how is this possible? But if she's betrothed to be married, she's probably gotten the talk. She probably understands. So what's happening here? And I believe, and I believe scripture supports this, otherwise I wouldn't be saying this, that she is asking this question out of her relationship with Joseph and even higher to that, her obedience to God's words. So let me explain. So Mary was betrothed to Joseph. And in that time, betrothals are not engagements as we have them today. They are legally and spiritually binding. They're basically marriages before marriages. So when Joseph founds out that Mary was pregnant, we read in the book of Matthew that he, it doesn't say he, he goes to break off the engagement with her. It reads that he goes off to resolve the what? The divorce with her quietly, okay? So in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of Jewish customs, and as she believed, in the eyes of God, this wasn't someone that she will marry. This is someone who is already now her beloved. Does that make sense? Okay. If at this point, Mary slept with someone or married someone that was not Joseph, what would she be committing? Adultery, all right? Not sex outside of marriage, adultery, okay? So perhaps when the angel said you shall conceive, there was a sense of immediacy of this conception happening like right now. We do read that Gabriel, unlike the other angels, looks like a dude. We read that Gabriel has the appearance of a man. So maybe, I don't know, maybe Mary was like, are you going to give me the son? Um, maybe. Perhaps it was the fact that the angel called Jesus the son of the most high. And that, that phrase, all the other prophetic phrases are mentioned in the Old Testament. That phrase isn't, okay, the son of the most high. And she, he didn't call Jesus the son of who? Joseph, all right? So maybe, maybe it's this. Maybe it's the fact, and I don't think it's this, but I'm just going to say it. Maybe it's the fact that as wonderful as Mary thought Joseph was, she could not conceive of Joseph being the father of the Messiah. I don't think it's that. I think my man Joseph was pretty rad, but that, that could be the possibility. But whatever the reason, whatever the reason, her question suggests that Mary understood the angel as telling her that someone, listen, that someone other than Joseph was going to be the father of her promised child. 